My name is Helen Collins and I'm 29 years old. I work at the local library in a quaint town that most people probably hadn't heard of. My life is simple, perhaps too simple for some, but it's mine. I've always been the quiet type, finding solace in books rather than in the noisy bustle of the outside world. The library is my sanctuary. It's a charming old building with creaky floors and shelves that have seen better days, but to me, it's perfect. Every day, I unlock the doors at 8 o'clock a.m., turn on the lights, and inhale the comforting scent of books. It's a routine that never grows old. My parents passed away when I was young, and I was raised by my grandmother. She was a kind woman who always encouraged me to read and learn, but now she's gone too, leaving me alone with no siblings or close relatives. Just me and my small, familiar world. Good morning, Helen. Mr. Jenkins, a regular visitor, greets me as he enters. He's an elderly man who spends his days immersed in history books. Good morning, Mr. Jenkins. The new shipment of history books arrived yesterday. I've set them aside for you, I reply with a smile. Ah, you know me too well, dear, he chuckles, shuffling towards the designated shelf. The day continues in this comforting pattern. Familiar faces come and go. I help a group of kids find books for their school project, recommend a romance novel to Mrs. Harrison, and guide Mr. Thompson to the science fiction section. It's a quiet life, but I find comfort in its predictability and routine. Then, one day, everything changed. Jack walked into my life. He came in looking for a book, but with his crisp suit and confident stride, he was clearly not the typical library visitor. Can you help me find a book? he asked, his voice smooth and inviting. Of course, what are you looking for? I replied, trying to maintain my composure. It's a novel, The Great Gatsby, he said. Right this way, I said, leading him to the classics section. As I handed him the book, our hands brushed briefly, sending a jolt through me. It was a fleeting touch, but it lingered in my thoughts. Thank you, Helen, he said, glancing at my name tag. I'm Jack. It's nice to meet you. That's nice to meet you too, Jack. I replied. That brief encounter marked the beginning of everything. It was the start of a love I hoped would last a lifetime and a journey that would take me from my quiet life into a whirlwind of chaos and betrayal. If only I had known then what I know now, maybe things would have been different. But life doesn't come with a warning label, and sometimes we have to learn the hard way. After that first meeting, Jack began to visit the library more often. It was odd, even that he didn't seem like the reading type but each visit he would ask for a book recommendation and spend a few minutes chatting with me. One day, he came in just as I was struggling with a box of newly arrived books. Need a hand with that, he offered, walking over. That would be great, thanks, I said, relieved. As we placed the books on the shelves, he asked, So, Helen, what got you into working at a library? I shrugged. I've always loved books. They're like friends to me, you know? Plus, it's nice and quiet here. He laughed. I can see that. It's like a whole different world. Our conversations grew longer with each visit. I learned that Jack worked in his family's real estate business. He was easy to talk to and for the first time in a long time, I felt someone was genuinely interested in me. Then one day he surprised me. Helen, would you like to have dinner with me tonight? He asked, a hopeful look in his eyes. I was taken aback. Like a date? Yes, like a date, he said, smiling. I hesitated. This was new territory for me, but there was something about him that made me want to say yes. Okay, sure, I'd like that. I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. We went to a small restaurant in town, nothing fancy but cozy. We talked about everything and nothing, and for a few hours, I forgot about my usually solitary life. As we walked home, Jack said, I had a really great time tonight, Helen. You're very different from the people I'm used to. I didn't know how to respond, so I just smiled. Jack continued, I'd like to see you again. Would that be okay? I nodded, feeling a flutter of excitement. Yes, I'd like that. From then on, our meetings became more frequent. Jack would take me out to dinner, or we'd go for walks. For the first time, I felt like I was part of something bigger, a world beyond books and solitude. It wasn't long before I fell for him deeply. He was charming and attentive, making me feel special. So when he proposed, I didn't hesitate. I said yes. Looking back, I wish I had recognized the warning signs. I wish I had seen that his charm was merely a mask, concealing something much less pleasant. But love has a way of blinding you, making you overlook red flags. And I was utterly in love, or at least I thought I was.
After Jack and I got engaged, things began to shift. It started with his parents. They never approved of me, deeming me unworthy because I didn't come from money. The first time I met them, it was clear they didn't like me. We were at their grand, opulent house, a stark contrast to my humble surroundings. Helen, this is my mother, Margaret, and my father, Richard. Jack introduced me. Nice to meet you, I said, forcing a smile. Margaret looked me up and down. So, you're the girl who works at the library? Yes, I am, I replied, feeling increasingly small under her scrutiny. Richard then added, Jack, couldn't you find someone more suitable? I felt like shrinking into the floor. The dinner was long and uncomfortable. They made it clear they thought I was beneath their son, but Jack defended me, which only made me love him more. Before our wedding, they insisted on a prenuptial agreement. They claimed it was just a formality. With little to lose, I agreed without making a fuss. After we married, I moved into Jack's house, which turned out to be his parents' house. They had given it to him as a wedding gift, but they acted like it was still their home. His parents would drop by unannounced and start giving orders. Helen, make us some coffee, Margaret would demand as soon as she walked in, and I would comply without protest. I didn't want to stir up trouble, so I kept quiet. One day, Margaret pointed to the TV and said, Remember, Helen, in case of divorce, you can't claim this. It felt like that with everything. They constantly reminded me that none of the house's belongings were mine. Jack began to change, too. He wasn't the man I had fallen in love with. He started joining in on his parents' jokes about me. One evening, as I was trying to decide what to wear for a family event, I asked Jack for his opinion. This one makes you look less drab, he said, laughing. I was hurt. It felt like he was a different person around his parents. He no longer stood up for me. Instead, he laughed along with them. Living in that house became increasingly exhausting. I felt like an outsider, an unwelcome guest. I kept hoping things would improve, but they only worsened. The stress took a toll on me. I began having severe stomach pains that I tried to ignore until one day a collapse at the library. When I woke up in the hospital, the doctor told me it was stress-related. I spent several days there, and Jack didn't visit or even call. I felt utterly alone. Then, one day, a notary came to my room with surprising news. My great-aunt, whom I barely remembered, had passed away and left me her fortune, thirty million dollars. I was stunned. I didn't know what to do with that kind of money, but suddenly, I wasn't just the poor girl from the library anymore. When Jack and his parents found out, they came to visit me, all smiles and sweetness. Darling, we're so happy for you, Margaret said, her voice oozing with false concern. Yes, we're a family. We should support each other, Richard added. I was skeptical. The change in their demeanor was too abrupt. After they left, I overheard them talking outside my room. They didn't realize I was listening. She's such a fool. Can you believe our luck? Jack laughed. We need to make sure she doesn't leave you, Jack. Maybe you should have a child with her. That will tie her down, Margaret suggested. I felt sick to my stomach. It was clear they didn't care about me. They just wanted my money. At that moment, I knew exactly what I had to do. I had to leave that house and those people behind. I was determined to take control of my life and no longer be their victim. I left the hospital with a clear plan in mind. When I returned home, Jack and his parents were there, putting on their best smiles and pretending to be the caring family they never truly were. Oh, Helen, we were so worried about you, Margaret said, her voice laced with fiend concern. I nodded in response but kept my words minimal. I needed to maintain a facade, not giving them any hint of my true intentions. Jack approached me, his curiosity barely concealed. So, when do you get the inheritance? he asked, his eagerness too apparent. I looked at him, the man I once thought I loved, and realized I didn't recognize him anymore. Soon, I replied, but it's not something you need to worry about. His smile faltered slightly, but he pressed on. But we're Mary, Helen. What's yours is mine, right? I forced a smile. Of course, darling. That night, I couldn't sleep. Their insincere voices, their greed, it all echoed in my mind and made me nauseous. I got up and started writing, pouring out all my frustrations and pain onto paper. It felt like a dam had burst, releasing years of pent-up emotions. The next morning, I met with a lawyer. I laid out everything that had happened and showed him the prenuptial agreement. His shock was evident. But he assured me, the agreement will protect you. You're doing the right thing. When I returned home, Jack and his parents were lounging in the living room. They looked up as I walked in. 
There she is, our brave girl, Richard said, his smile not reaching his eyes. I sat down, clutching my purse tightly. I have something to say. I began, causing them to focus on me with curiosity. I'm filing for divorce, I announced, my voice steady. The room fell silent. Margaret was the first to break the silence. What, you ungrateful little, she sputtered. Jack jumped to his feet. Helen, you can't be serious. We love you. Do you, Jack? I retorted. Because I don't feel loved. I feel used. Margaret's face turned red with fury. We'll sue you. We'll take half of your inheritance. I reached into my purse and pulled out a copy of the prenuptial agreement. Actually, you can't. This states that neither of us can claim the other's property in case of divorce. For the first time, they were left speechless. I felt a surge of empowerment as I stood up. I'm leaving. I don't want any of you to contact me, I declared. With that, I walked out of the house, the shouts and insults echoing behind me. It was the hardest thing I had ever done. But as I drove away, a tremendous weight seemed to lift from my shoulders. For the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of freedom and relief from their disdain and manipulation. I didn't know what the future held, but it had to be better than the past. I rented a modest apartment in the city, nothing extravagant, but it was mine. For the first time in years I felt a deep sense of peace. I was still navigating the divorce, but I felt ready to handle it. One day, I received a call from my lawyer. Helen, there's something you should know about your great-aunt's will, he said. I was intrigued. What about it? There's a condition. A portion of your inheritance must be used for a charitable cause. It was your great-aunt's final wish. I was taken aback. I had no idea, I replied. She was quite the philanthropist, the lawyer continued. She wanted to pass that legacy on to you. I hung up, reflecting on the news. My great-aunt had given me a chance to make a positive impact. It felt like a sign, a push towards something meaningful. I began researching charities and causes, eager to find a way to contribute. That's when I came across a small organization dedicated to helping women who were victims of domestic abuse. It struck a chord with me. I reached out and arranged a meeting with Linda, the organization's director. Linda's passion was palpable. We provide shelter, legal aid, and counseling to women in desperate situations, she explained. I was moved by her stories and felt a renewed sense of purpose. I want to help, I said, determined to make a difference. With Linda's guidance, I allocated a portion of the inheritance to fund a new shelter. The feeling of knowing I was helping others find a way out was profoundly fulfilling. A few weeks later, Linda invited me to the shelter's opening. It was a modest event, but the atmosphere was filled with hope and gratitude. As I mingled with the attendees, I spotted a familiar face in the crowd. It was Sarah, an old colleague from the library. Helen, is that you? She exclaimed, surprised. Sarah, it's been so long, I said, embracing her. What are you doing here? I shared with her the story of the shelter and my involvement. Her eyes widened with admiration. That's incredible, Helen. I had no idea. It's a new chapter for me, I said, smiling. We spent the evening catching up, and it felt wonderful to reconnect with an old friend. As the event drew to a close, Linda approached me. Helen, I can't thank you enough. This shelter will change lives. And in that moment, I knew that I had found a new purpose, one that had been missing from my life for far too long. As I looked around at the faces of the women now finding refuge at the shelter, I felt a deep warmth in my heart, something I hadn't experienced in a long time. It was a comforting realization that this was the least I could do for those who needed it most. Each day at the shelter began to blend together, filled with rewarding work that gave me a newfound sense of purpose. Then, out of nowhere, my phone rang. The caller ID displayed a number I hadn't seen in a while. Jax. My heart raced with a mix of emotions, but curiosity got the better of me. Hello, Jack, I answered, trying to keep my voice steady. Helen, I need to talk to you. Can we meet? It's urgent, he said, his voice tinged with desperation. Despite my reluctance, I agreed to meet him at a familiar coffee shop, hoping the neutral setting would give me strength. As I sat across from Jack, I noticed he looked different, defeated and almost pishable. His eyes were filled with a desperate plea. Helen, I made a huge mistake. I want you back. I've realized how much you mean to me, he blurted out. I stared at him, feeling nothing but contempt. Why now, Jack? He sighed heavily. My parents controlled everything. They were the reason our marriage failed. I was weak, but I'm different now. 
A surge of anger rose within me. You blame your parents, but you stood by while they treated me like dirt. You laughed along with them. Jack reached for my hand, but I pulled away. Please, Helen, I know I was wrong. I've changed. I looked at him, seeing the shadow of the man I once loved but no longer felt anything for. Changed or not, it's too late. I feel nothing for you, nothing but contempt. His face fell, and for a fleeting moment, I saw the man I had married. But it was brief and quickly replaced by the reality of who he had become. I'm sorry, Jack. I've moved on. I have a new life now. A purpose. There's no place for you in it, I said firmly. He nodded slowly, a look of resignation settling on his face. I understand. I just had to try. Leaving the coffee shop, I felt a profound sense of relief. It was over, truly over. The next day, the shelter hosted an event to unveil a sculpture donated by a local artist. As I stood among those who supported and believed in me, I felt a deep sense of belonging. Sarah, my old colleague from the library, stood beside me. You've done something amazing here, Helen, she said with a smile. The artist revealed the sculpture, a figure of a woman reaching up towards the sky, symbolizing hope, strength, and new beginnings. The applause that followed filled the air, and for a moment, Everything felt right in the world. Linda, who had been such a guiding force, came over to me. Helen, this is just the beginning. There's so much more we can do. I looked around at the faces filled with hope and knew she was right. This was my new beginning, and I was ready to embrace it fully. My life was now busy and fulfilling, with each day at the shelter bringing new challenges and rewards. My confidence grew, and for the first time in years I felt in control of my own destiny. I even began taking self-defense classes, something I would have never imagined doing before. One day, as I was leaving the shelter, I noticed a car parked outside. It was my mother-in-law, Margaret. She stepped out as soon as she saw me. Helen, we need to talk, she said, her voice softer than I'd ever heard it before. I have nothing to say to you, Margaret, I replied firmly. Please, just hear me out. I've realized how wrong we were, she pleaded. I paused and looked at her. She seemed sincere, but I couldn't forget the past. What do you want, Margaret? I want to apologize, she said, her eyes glistening with tears. I treated you terribly. I've lost my son because of it, and I don't want to lose you too. You were like the daughter I never had. I felt a pang of sympathy, but I pushed it away. Margaret, you made my life a living hell. An apology won't change that. I've moved on, and I suggest you do the same. She reached out to me, but I stepped back. Please, Helen. I know I can't undo the past, but I want to make things right. I shook my head. It's too late for that. Goodbye, Margaret. As I walked away, I felt her gaze on my back but didn't look back. I had learned to stand up for myself, and there was no going back to the way things were. The next day, I received a letter from Jack's lawyer. He was contesting the divorce settlement. I wasn't surprised, but I was ready. I met with my lawyer, a sharp woman named Rachel. He's got no leg to stand on, Helen. The prenuptial agreement is clear. He's just trying to intimidate you, Rachel said confidently. I nodded. I'm not afraid of him anymore. Let's fight this. When the court date arrived, I walked in with my head held high. Jack was there with his lawyer, and for a moment, our eyes met. There was a fleeting glimpse of the old Jack, the one I had loved, but it vanished quickly. The judge listened to both sides and then made her decision. The prenuptial agreement stood, and Jack's claims were dismissed. I felt a surge of relief and triumph. After the court session, Jack approached me. Helen, I'm sorry, I was wrong, he said, his voice low. I looked at him, seeing the man I once loved but now felt nothing for. Goodbye, Jack, take care of yourself. As I left the courtroom, I felt a sense of closure. That chapter of my life was finally over and a new one was just beginning. At the shelter, we were gearing up for a fundraiser and it was taking all my attention. The support from the community was overwhelming, and I felt a deep sense of gratitude. The night of the fundraiser arrived, and the place buzzed with energy. People from all walks of life had come to support our cause. As I looked around, I realized how far I had come, from a quiet, timid woman to someone who stood up for herself and others. You did it, Helen. This is amazing, Sarah said, coming up to me. I smiled. We did it, and there's so much more to do. As the event continued, I felt a profound sense of accomplishment and purpose. This was my life now, and I was exactly where I was meant to be.